farmer's markets aren't just about vegetables. Instead, they're full of homemade delights, pastries, local honeys, jellies, and eggs. Many of the vendors who sell at farmer's markets are so-called cottage producers. That means their operations are small, and they often cook or bake out of their homes. Cottage food producers have, of course, always existed, even if they weren't called that. But it's a food sector that's growing. I'm Mary Beth Lassiter. And I'm Melissa Hall. You're listening to Gravy. 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 (laughs) A production of the Southern Foodways Alliance, Gravy tells the stories of the changing American South. This is episode four in our five-part series on baking in the South. We've been following the story of Chef Camille Cogswell and the new bakery she recently moved into in the tiny mountain town of Marshall, North Carolina. It has a long and storied past. If you missed the other episodes, be sure and give them a listen. This is truly a saga of the little bakery that could. (laughs) Camille and her partner, Drew DeTomo, plan to run their business as a cottage bakery. It's a common approach for bakers everywhere, including in the South. In this episode, we'll meet some cottage bakers and hear more about Camille's plans from our reporter, Irina Zhuroff. But first... Since 2015, nonfiction coffee has taken a thoughtful approach toward transparency and traceability in coffee sourcing. Through meaningful relationship, intentional giving, and exceptional roasting, nonfiction honors the stories behind each coffee and serves as a trustworthy ally of growers, farm workers, and importers fighting for a more just and equitable supply chain. Learn more about their business model and shop their coffees at nonfictioncoffee.org. Nonfiction Coffee, Coffee at Its Word. Camille Cogswell and Drew DeTomo have followed relatively traditional paths into food careers culinary school, then jobs in various restaurants, moving up, up, up. By 2019, Camille was executive chef of a popular Israeli cafe in Philadelphia. Drew was preparing to sign a lease to open an Italian restaurant. Then came 2020. Camille was let go. The pandemic started, so Drew didn't sign his lease. And a property with a little house and bakery came on the market in Marshall, North Carolina, some 20 miles outside Camille's hometown of Asheville. The opportunity to build our own business here from what was already built here, from what was started, was what enticed us out here. Otherwise, there's no way... We would have just up and bought a home in rural North Carolina. There wouldn't have been that purpose and that draw to it. But the purpose was there, and they beat out other bidders and bought the place. In summers, the Appalachian Mountains that surround the property drip with greenery. Fog fills the valleys, making for moody mornings. The bakery is a separate building some 20 feet from the home, and it's equipped with two production-sized wood-fired ovens. Camille and Drew moved in, took in the views, and started putting together a business plan. We've tried to really set some goals for ourselves, especially having worked, both of us worked in the restaurant industry for the past 15 years. We're talking a lot about how to set boundaries and how to design our business, honestly, in a lot of ways that are the antithesis of places that we've worked in the past. Cooking in restaurants can be grueling work, long hours on your feet, often low pay, and unpredictable schedules. The hospitality industry has notoriously high rates of worker burnout. Camille says many of her friends who've started businesses are pushing back against this dynamic. Doing a lot of things that are untraditional and just calling the shots on when they want to close to have family time or only being open certain days a week, being closed on holidays. And they have very successful businesses and people are accepting of that. Camille and Drew decided they could call the shots by opening a cottage bakery, Small scale, just the two of them doing all the baking, especially at first. They'll sell their bread, pies, crostatas, cookies, and croissants from a walk-up window right on the property. They'll be open two days a week on the weekends. 
though that still means they'll be working four to five days a week. A lot of our conversations are around what what does our ideal work week look like? What does our ideal business look like? What does it look like 10 years from now? Cottage bakeries, basically a term for people selling baked goods out of their homes, have always existed. Officially, though, for much of the 20th century, selling food made at home was largely prohibited. That started to change in the 1990s and early 2000s, when a small number of states passed laws allowing such sales. In the wake of the 2008 recession, every state followed suit, allowing people to make money during a tough time. During our current national crisis, the COVID pandemic, some states loosen their cottage food laws, lifting earning caps and restrictions on what people can sell. Quarantined at home, with time on their hands, people started baking. And instead of a new hobby, some saw a business opportunity. The number of cottage bakeries once again exploded. Many bakers like Camille and Drew are drawn to the cottage model during times of transition. For them, and others we'll hear from, it's a chance to reshuffle priorities and create a sustainable work life with a relatively small investment. For others, a cottage bakery is a stepping stone. Take, for example, Between the Trees Bread. My name's Dalen Gray. I'm Tatiana McGee. It's Dalen's brainchild, for sure, and I call it my adopted child. (laughs) Dalen and Tatiana just showed up one day at my local farmer's market in Boone, North Carolina, selling beautiful, deeply golden sourdough loaves and flaky croissants. By week two at the market, a line snaked to their table. Word had traveled fast. When I reached out to them, it turned out they bake five doors down from where I live. We're in the bottom of uh, my mom's house. It, this was a garage. And then with COVID, they, the refinancing, she wanted to renovate anyways. So this will be like a, either an extra room or an Airbnb when we're done here. They started in the space in January 2021. But Dalen's been baking since 2015 when he took a climbing trip to France. It was like the gateway bread drug, I guess. I would get off the train and I would grab a baguette, maybe some fruit and some cheese, and that was the food for the day. And I fell in love with that, particularly. I just liked the breaking off a piece, you know. I just liked the taste of it, everything about it. And then making it was what I really fell in love with. At first he tinkered inconsistently, baking a loaf now and then. Then in 2018, he got deeper into baking. I get hooked really easily. He became obsessed with crumb and how the bread rose in the oven. And so I kept on making it. I kept on giving it away. By 2020, two things made Dalen professionalize his baking. He was working as a cook, and the chef at his restaurant said he wanted to start using his bread. And then the other big thing was COVID. Restaurants, including the one where he worked, closed. I was making more on unemployment than I ever made cooking in a kitchen. And I had all the time in the world to practice bread and start building the because most of most of the work that's come from has been figuring out how to scale and figuring out how to build a business um like god accounting like i don't even she does all of that together dalen and tatiana transformed his hobby into a business on the wintry friday night i came by their basement bakery it was warm and busy so right now we're shaping bread for the winter market tomorrow morning. This is country sourdough. And then um, croissants and baguettes are proving. Um, yeah, that's what we're doing right now. Got to put those in the oven. He'll make about 120 loaves this week. Winter market is slower than the summer farmer's market when he makes about 350 loaves a week and some 200 hand-laminated croissants. To bake at that scale requires a delicate dance around the tiny space as they massage doughs, shape, and score on a loop. When Dalen goes to stick some croissants in the oven, Tatiana turns to clean it. (laughs) The never-ending sweep. Yeah, we're always sweeping. Always sweeping. And even if you just swept, you can sweep again (laughs) and still find flour. (laughs) It's like part of us at this point. 
Tatiana still has a day job, but Dalen is full-time. Full-time plus, she jokes, in the summer. Although I'm, I love making bread and everything about this has been positive for my life, it is the most stressed I've ever been in my entire life. It's the business side of it. There's a lot of lack of security that comes from financial unknowings. There's a big dream in our culture of like working for yourself and like entrepreneurship. I think a lot of people would think of like a cottage baker as like a dream, you know, like you're baking bread, but to make this sustainable for yourself, it requires you to make a lot. Other bakers have told me this, that it's hard to make a living, a loaf at a time. So for Dale and Tatiana, sustainability means a brick and mortar shop. While Camille and Drew see the cottage model as a way to avoid the production hamster wheel, Dalen and Tatiana feel like they're on a hamster wheel now, constantly churning out baked goods. Part of that is because, unlike Camille and Drew, they don't have a giant oven. So they spend entire days baking load after load in a smaller oven. I think scaling is an important way to make it sustainable for us because right now, a lack of equipment and a lack of help means a lot of work and a lot of hours on our part. A shop would allow them to get some equipment that would ease croissant production, maybe a bigger oven too, so they could bake more in fewer loads. Maybe it allowed Tatiana to go full time. She has dreams for the space too. I'm Colombian American and in Colombia, there's bakeries everywhere. It's it's not uncommon to see them like on every single block or side by side. There's breads there that I've never had in the U.S. unless I'm like in Miami. So I've been trying to figure out a recipe for a bread that I really like. That's called pan de bono, which is has like yuca flour, it has corn flour, and it's cheesy. She wants to introduce breads like that to Boone. That's what I'm most excited about. They want to be in a commercial space in a year. But real estate in Boone, college town and tourist destination, is crazy right now. And Tatiana wants to be sure that if they do take on extra help, they can pay a livable wage. That does add a lot of extra stress and probably will make the timeline longer than other places. Because it's different if you, like, hire and you're like, yeah, we'll pay you seven twenty-five an hour compared to, like, we want to hire, but we want to make sure that people get paid at least 15 an hour, at the very least. Like Camille and Drew, they've worked in restaurants, and they love food. And they want a different work environment than what they've known. Starting as a cottage bakery, which has required relatively little investment, has allowed them the flexibility to get their feet under them as a business. Now they're trying to figure out what will work going forward. You want to do things right, you know, like, and it's easy to get caught up in bottom line thinking, and it's like not what we're about. But I'm finding myself very much so getting caught up in it. It's a tendency he fights. But a brick and mortar would require making rent, paying workers, and other expenses they don't currently have. And then that will be another set of challenges. I leave that night with an armful of warm bread. Dalen and Tatiana bake until 9. They'll come back around 4 in the morning to finish. Then, the Saturday market. I really enjoy seeing people get like something that's still warm and that's really fresh. Sisters Reina Soto and Adriana Ipina run a cottage bakery called El Fantastico in Duncanville, Texas, south of Dallas. Like Dalen and Tatiana, they're dreaming of a storefront, but they're not as ready to go all in yet. They primarily make Mexican pan dulce, sweet baked goods. They started their business during the pandemic. We live in an area where there's not many bakeries, at least not Mexican bakeries. It was Mother's Day coming up, Day and um, since, you know, we wanted to make her feel special because of everything that was going on, I decided to make her favorite, which are conchas. So that was the first thing we actually baked. Conchas are a sweet bread with a crunchy top layer. They look like seashells. Their mom really loved them. So from there, we were like, you know what? Father's Day is coming up next month. Mm-hmm. Let's go ahead and make my dad's favorite. Which are maranitas. Mexican maranitas are like gingerbread cookies, but shaped into little piggies. 
We ended up with 73 on our first batch. And we're like, man, this is a lot of maranitas. Our kitchen was basically full of pig sweeper. <laughs> which is all these maranitas, and they look so pretty. And uh, We posted them online. Yeah, we started taking pictures, you know, just for social media, just for, for our friends. And um, just so that we could share that, we had all these maranitas just stacked up on our counter. And uh, people started messaging us. Our friends were like, oh, man, are you selling those? Look really good. And we kept receiving messages like that. How much are they? Or, um, like, uh, how can we get yeah, those? Yeah, how can we get these? And, and how can we pick them up? And things like that. And um, we kind of um, just looked at each other. The following weekend, they were like, let's do this. Let's start a bakery. And we named it El Fantastico, which is kind of like amazing bread, you know? Yeah, a uh, pun. A pun, yeah. <laughs> Both Reina and Adriana have full-time jobs. Reina manages facilities for the county of Dallas, and Adriana is a teacher. At the height of the pandemic, when they were home, it was easier to bake and work. Now, they do it mostly on the weekends. Reina says financially, it's been a boon. Not long ago, she purchased a home. It helped a lot pay pay a lot of the electricity, water, <laughs> gas. Um, I mean, the extra income helps a lot. We're not going to lie. But it's it's so amazing to see your work. It's so amazing to see people share your stuff, how they talk about you. And we, we want to grow. We want to make something something bigger that we can focus on more full-time than, than what we do right now. Recently, the host of a pop-up they participated in asked them where they see themselves in five years. They hadn't really thought about it. The cottage model is more forgiving as they figure things out. They don't have a clear plan yet, but since then, they've settled on a vision. We want to set up like a stop-and-go bakery. Yes. Yeah, in Mexican uh, panaderias, you can stop by and they have other things such as tamales and they also have an assortment of jellos, and some of them are very, very decorative jellos, and they're beautiful. Cakes. And, and cakes and things like that. And so our goal would be that, would be to be able to provide that Mexican panaderia feeling, but here locally. If every cottage bakery turns into a storefront, will bakers lose the flexibility and sense of adventure afforded by a low-investment cottage model? and potentially open themselves up to the risks that come with brick and mortar? Maybe. And maybe that's why some cottage bakers aren't fully convinced a storefront is the way to go. Staying small can have its own rewards. When we come back, Irina Zhurov takes us to meet another baker who's contemplating whether a storefront would even be worth it. Ready for cookout season? Lodge helps you savor the outdoors with cast iron cookware and grilling accessories that can handle the heat. Whether you're cooking under the stars or grilling for the neighborhood, Lodge brings you fan favorites like the portable Sportsman's Pro Grill. Up your game with smoker skillets and grilling baskets, or get creative with classic Dutch ovens and skillets. Crafted in America with just iron and oil, Lodge Cast Iron helps you turn every outdoor meal into a masterpiece. Go to LodgeCastIron.com to shop the full collection and savor the outdoors. For their support of the Southern Foodways Alliance and this podcast, we thank Lodge. Sierra Patterson used to be a preschool teacher and naturalist in Auburn, Alabama. We had a 100% outdoor nature schooling program at a local forest preserve. But when COVID closure started, her school shuttered. It started making bread. She wasn't alone, of course. Home bakers were so enthusiastic early in the pandemic that sales of King Arthur flour soared by 2,000% in spring of 2020. Initially, Sierra was baking yeasted breads based on family recipes. And then the sourdough thing happened when I couldn't find yeast anymore in the stores when um, everything went on lockdown. It was at completely out of necessity and just the hobby, and I like to do things with my hands, and we were stuck at home, and I had the time to fool around with learning this, learning it, so, so that's what I did. People wanted to buy her bread. Sierra formed a cottage bakery called Sour South, turned her garage into a workspace, and started selling out at the farmer's market. I can't say that I would have 
followed this path if I hadn't been afforded that time. When her school opened back up, she decided not to go back to her teaching job, but rather to go all in with the bakery. It was not a hard decision. I really, really fell in love with it. And I, I just found myself still being able to connect with people and with nature and with food in a way that I was also doing <laughs> as a nature preschool teacher. Another major factor that convinced her to leave her job and bake full-time was her now six-year-old son. When her job started back up, he wasn't school age. They didn't have child care. There were still no vaccines for COVID. And all of those things made her uncomfortable going back. So she thought, Okay, you know what? We're just going to keep doing what we've been doing. I'm going to keep making bread, but make it a thing. You know, really start pushing it as a business, not just selling to neighbors and friends, but really go for it. And so, yeah, we sat down as a family and we're like, well, just go for this. And um, it gave us a lot of flexibility for my son to be able to be home. Now Sierra makes sourdough breads and various pastries, including croissants. There's not much competition in her town. No brick-and-mortar bakery that isn't Panera, she says. No other cottage bakers that do bread. So she's done pretty well financially, too. I am making exponentially more than I did for our family than I did at my previous job. So yes, it is, it's paying off in that way. A majority of cottage bakers are women, and many live in rural areas where opportunities can be more limited, childcare less available, and salaries lower. For Sierra, the bakery addressed all of these issues. Her business fills a gap in the community. She doesn't have to pay for childcare, and she's able to contribute more income for her family. But when she thinks about the future of her business, she's torn about whether to continue as a cottage bakery or try setting up a storefront. On the one hand... It's very easy to just kind of stay home and keep doing what you're doing and not have to worry about childcare again. You know, if you have a brick and mortar, you're at a shop, you're not at home. And so... Your kid either has to come with you or you have to figure out childcare. And here, it's a little bit of both. I can be working and he can be in his home and comfortable and and it's free. Half the time, I'm really, really happy and content doing exactly what I'm doing. But she also has this other dream. I know that I could take on more productively. And I'm the type of person who likes to kind of push those limits and see how much I can really do. And I have that kind of natural ambition, I think, in me. She's still deciding. But for Camille Cogswell and Drew DeTalmo, the new owners of the home and bakery in Marshall, North Carolina, they've already decided. They've worked at brick-and-mortar shops. They know that life. They're opting for something else now. Walnut Family Bakery will be their family business, a workshop, a gathering place, and a home. A kind of third space that feels fitting for the way some cooks are thinking about their lives today. You know, we're not going to make a lot of money, but it will be what keeps us happy. They'll expand the orchard, plant flowers, vegetables, and herbs. Maybe they'll have children. The customers wandering around will be part of the place, too. Maybe it's the ultimate bringing your work home. Or maybe it's a way to challenge that expectation. Gravy was reported and produced by Irina Zhuroff, who used to bake bread out of a wood-fired oven at an eatery in Chile. Special thanks to audio engineer Bethany Sands. We thank Wendell Patrick for Gravy's theme music and Jazar for our donor music. Managing editor for Gravy and all other SFA media is Sarah Camp Milam. Olivia Terenzio provides additional editing, and Katie King is our fact checker. Visit southernfoodways.org to make a donation. Your dollars fund our good work. And while you've got your phone in your hand, download our SFA Stories app, underwritten by Tabasco, and let SFA be your guide as you explore the South. I'm Mary Beth Lasseter. I'm Melissa Hall. Excited to lap up another episode of Gravy? Tell a friend. Pass the gravy boat. There is so much gravy to go around. So much gravy.